is a wild. Forever Bridge meets a royal bridge. You see a bridge? They raise you three bridges. Bridge! I win! Hello and welcome to Triple Dummy. I'm Pete Hollands, and with me as usual I've got Nick Jacob, and we've got special guests tonight. Uh, we've got uh, Liam Mill. He is a uh, recent uh, Australian Open team player, and has come to join us on uh, Triple Dummy. Thanks for joining us, Liam. Yeah, thanks for having me. No worries. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, a few different topics. We're going to be talking about the new uh, BBO suggested uh, BBO hybrid device for anti-cheating. Uh, we're going to be talking about a few recent results, and uh, then we've also got uh, talks about different scoring methods, because there's a lot of different scoring methods. Uh, some action from the ground, because uh, you were over in uh, the American National just recently, Mill. And uh, finally, we'll finish with some tips on how to choose what information is useful to when deciding to play a hand. Anyway, uh, Nick, what are your thoughts on uh, the suggested... BB-08OH device for uh, anti-cheating. And what is it? Well, it looks... What is it? That's an excellent question. Um, I'm sort of... Uh, okay, so the way that screens work, if you haven't played with screens before, is you have a screen cutting across diagonally. One screen that allows uh, two opponents to see each other, but they cannot see their partner. So I can't remember what the split is, like north and east or south and west or whatever it is. The yeah, point yeah, is right. that you're trying to, yeah, so you're trying to limit uh, unauthorized information to your partner. BBOH is going for even more screens, from what I can see. It's got kind of, you know, a four-way perpendicular screen action going on. And um, everyone, everyone uses tablets to bid and... I believe they use them for play as well, do they? Yeah, so I think they use them for play. Um, so you get the hands just put onto your tablet and you play. You can't see your partner at all, which is very slightly different to screens where you can see like this small section of it, of your partner. Um, you don't pass the bidding tray, but you bid on it and you play it. That's basically what I think it is. Um, what are your thoughts about how it actually works? Do you reckon it's a good idea? Um, well, I mean, I, I'm kind of a, um, I don't know, naive person in this regard. I kind of like to believe that most people aren't trying to rub you blind. And evidently it's been proven untrue. <laughs> uh, however, you know, it's kind of, for me, it's just all, they're all further steps into the direction of, okay, we're going to play in four separate rooms. So we can't hear anyone. You know, this is kind of where it's heading. I mean, you're still going to have people coughing and chatting away and bantering, and it's kind of, you know, I mean, maybe that it, maybe the people who want to make bridge into the cleanest possible game, which should be everyone, but you know, the particular groups on at the moment, the particular administration um, plans. I kind of feel like they, they wouldn't want people to banter. I think they would want that social element to kind of disappear a little, which I think is a shame. It's, I mean, I actually really enjoy the social element of playing behind screens because you can, you know, you can kind of talk shit or, you know, you know, express disappointment. I, I, bet, I, bet, you'll stop, uh, I bet you'll stop showing your hands to your screen mate though, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you'll stop, stop showing your screen, your hand to your screen, mate. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm slowly getting there. <laughs> it might still happen, you know, once a year or so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you reckon, Milne? Do you like the idea of the new thing? Yeah, so it's got some um, pretty cool advantages over... Um, normal screens. Um, the first one is that you can see both your opponents rather than just one, which is pretty cool. Um, so in some senses, like, the, the social element has increased. I mean, there's, there's not going to be as much banter, but you can, like, get reads on both opponents, which yeah. wasn't possible before. Um, you know, you can see when both of your opponents are in the tank, which uh, is, is, is quite cool. Um, at the same time, it completely reduces your view of your partner, which I think is fine. Um, 
it, even though Nick says, you know, it's, uh, you don't want to believe everyone's trying to rob you blind. Well, they're, they're not trying to, but they accidentally end up doing it because they know what their partner has inadvertently from unauthorized information. And there are a few threads on bridge winners at the moment just from spots where the, guy, the opening leader's partner hesitates to trick one and then the leader's partner knows exactly what his problem is and works out the whole hand and, and defends a hand double dummy. And it's not, no one's trying to cheat you. No one's using illegal signals, but it's just, you know, that's just unavoidable when you can kind of see what your partner's up to. Um, at the same time, like, I hate the fact that you're not playing with playing cards anymore. Um, that's, that's just, I don't know. <laughs> that, it really puts me off, and I feel like that's a publicity issue as well. Um, it, it might turn people off the game if they're not actually playing a card game anymore. They're actually just uh, getting reduced to this very uh, abstract thing on, on iPads and so on. There's also technology issues. Um, even when the view graph goes down when you're playing a match, you can still keep playing yeah. cards. Um, that, that won't happen. <laughs> if yeah. the wireless goes down uh, when you're playing a big match, that could cause some real issues. I mean, maybe you could do yeah. it on some sort of private network or something, um, not over the internet, um, and, and then have that from that server broadcast to the internet. Um, but at the same time, you don't want your play of the hand to rely on internet access. <laughs> yeah, I would just be able to keep playing. So there's a few few pros and cons. I, I, when I talked to um, Gittleman about it over in Denver, he basically said, you know, could be good, could be bad, who knows, but let's put it out there and see what the public has to think. Right? At the end of the day, Gittleman's opinion doesn't matter. Uh, my opinion yep. doesn't matter. It's what players as a whole think of it. And anything that's sort of put out there as an idea can get trialed and... and um, and, and yeah, but maybe people like it, maybe, maybe they don't. Uh, I, I think that's a real thing. It, it doesn't actually matter how good something is in theory, it's just whether the general population like it. Um, yeah, yeah. But that, that's my view on it. I mean, it's definitely got, the, the whole not playing cards thing is a big sticker for me, but there's, not, there's not lots of good things about it. For yeah, sure. definitely. I am all for giving it a shot. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was that uh, uh, you got, I don't like, with regular screens, you had unauthorized information with when partner tanked and stuff. But because you can see both your opponents, you can still tell when your partner's tanking, right? Just because you can't see them, like you yeah, still know. I had I hadn't thought of that. that. That's actually yeah. That's that's one of the great things about screens that you like. Sometimes you know who's thinking on the other side of the screen, but a lot of the time you don't. Especially if people are careful with um, how they use their bidding boxes. Like, for example, one thing I do is I pull out all my pass cards and I pass with them from the table rather than out of the box. Because otherwise you can hear when I'm passing. Yeah. Right? And so you know who was thinking about a problem. Um, and, yeah, you could obviously, um, like, w w when if you can see both your opponents, that, that whole ambiguity thing is gone. Um, yeah. That's, that's, that's a, definitely a problem. Like... I, I, I see what you mean there, and that's, that's actually, maybe, maybe a better way of doing this would be to have just two of these iPads, but just behind a normal screen, the same as it is at the moment. That, that might yeah. be another thing that could be filed. Mm. So. Yeah. Any more thoughts, Nick? Yeah, there was, I mean, I know it's a, a part of UGRAF here to hit for, for the commentator to time when they put uh, input cards and bids, so, because you want to put through the two screen mates to actions at the same time so yeah. that it goes click click and that way no one really knows who is hesitating or not i mean you, yeah. if it takes a minute you know i mean and the thing is most view graphers don't know how to even set up view graph or you know or any of the basic stuff let alone this etiquette there's some good ones but um, but it is tricky, and I think we need to find that kind of right marriage between technology. That includes holding the cards, feeling the cards in your hand, playing them. Um, and it is tricky because you don't know, you know. I mean, how can you how can you find a way of playing these cards, but also reducing the, the amount of information given by these player cards. The timing, where they land, what orientation they're in, anything like that. But prim primarily the timing, because as Liam says, a lot of people um, get advantages. Not a lot of people, everyone. Everyone gets advantages because 
someone has a legitimate problem, thinks about it, and then because of that, their partner knows it subconsciously that they don't have this. And yeah. it makes the subsequent defense much easier. So I think the only way to resolve that is to have all the cards played at the same time somehow. But I don't know. I some sort of maybe some help. sort of random delay uh, introduced. Maybe maybe like uh, yeah. <laughs> but the only way to do that would be electronically though. You couldn't do that with real yeah. life cards. But like no. you you can. Yeah, I think I think that you just have to choose. Do yeah. does it? Does, what's more important to you? Is it holding cards in your hand or is it completely eliminating cheating? I mean, for me, I I think that like the big cheating thing is first of all not that many people were doing it. Yeah. We didn't think anyone was doing it, but turned out a few people were, but most people aren't. And second, everyone knew that like that some of these players were cheating even though they didn't know how. And third, they did get caught. Everything's being videoed now. Now now there's like multiple different cheating methods that are known. When as long as you actually have like some sort of like instead of just having tournament directors, you actually have like a you know, just maybe just three guys at the end of a major tournament, go over some stuff and try to try to find patterns in the way people are doing things, like just some sort of anti-cheating squad, some sort of bridge police or something, you know? Yeah. If you had that, if you actually had anyone out there doing this rather than what's happening at the moment, which is this very informal, behind-the-scenes, uh, player-based, amateur people doing it for free just because they love the game sort of thing, right? If you actually had some professionals being paid to, like, forensically look at the videos, right, then that's, to me, that's, Plenty. You don't have to go to these pads, these iPads, and these this um, like hybrid screen thing. You can just catch people who cheat and like end their career. That should yeah. be enough of an incentive <laughs> to not cheat. You know, right? The yeah. fact that you're done, like yeah. you know, uh, what like what are Fisher and Schwartz going to do now? They're, like they they have no fallback career as far as I know. They they just they're bridge people. They've got literally nothing to fall back on. And that to me, that's a huge incentive not to cheat. And yeah. then you know that you're going to get caught sooner or later, you know, that, that, that to me is plenty. <laughs> there just needs to, to me, the, the area to be looking at is not how to use technology to get further away from bridge as we know it. It's um, how to use technology to police the game as we know it and, yeah. and make sure that you can't really cheat without there being pretty serious consequences and then, then being pretty likely consequences by, you know, by being caught. Yeah, definitely. Mm. With with this method, I think, like as we mentioned before, moving away from cards, like I think it's something that could be done. But to me, I reckon when I play in person and when I play on BBO is so different. I don't know which is better, but I know I enjoy in person and interaction and the cards in my hand and that sort of stuff. BBO just feels like different something, uh, different, not a completely different game, but something different to me. I wouldn't want to move the high-level competitive bridge all the way from the social aspect and the playing uh, cards and things like that. But it is something definitely worth looking into and going from there, I reckon. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Like, I, I feel like I play totally different on BBO. <laughs> I, reckon I'd, I reckon I would totally suck if I had to play on iPad. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of bridge careers being over, you bring an iPad to my bridge career. So. <laughs> well, also, imagine seniors. What would they do with, like, a seniors? Yeah. Like, these people that, like, there are some seniors that can use iPads. There are some yeah. that just avoid technology because they're not used to it. What are they yeah. meant to do? Are you going to force it down them and make them play on an iPad? There would be, like, so yeah. many, like, can I have an undo, like... Oh like, how God. would it happen? You'd have someone like playing cards and a young person sitting in front of them pressing like the iPad for them or something. I, I don't know how it would actually work, but <laughs> I feel sorry for like trying to introduce this and the seniors game trying to do something yeah. about it as well. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, we we're going to uh, discuss uh, recent results. So. There's just recently been a over in Denver, an American national. Uh, there's lots of different events that were held there. Uh, last podcast, we talked about the blue blue ribbon pairs, which uh, uh, grew and heard, was it, one? And, yeah, uh, yeah. That, like, happened right during the last podcast. Uh, the Risinger was uh, held uh, just after it, sort of like a couple of events that are held at once. 
and the Vang Vanaconus. Can you uh, pronounce yeah, it? Vi Vi Vinaconus, I think. Vanaconus. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Uh, they won it. Um, yeah. Sounded like a really top tier tournament. There was lots and lots of big names there for it. Yeah. So um, a Andy and I made the semis. Uh, we ended up thirteenth. We needed to make the top ten to make the final. Um, when we played in the semis, we knew pretty much everyone we played against. <laughs> it was like it was. Like I knew a higher percentage of my opponents at the rising of semi than in the bowl. Despite <laughs> <laughs> uh, the fact I've never been to an American national, uh, just top guys. So everyone was pretty good. Uh, uh, if you go through the list of people who made the semifinals, not that many soft spots, you know. Um, I, I, I felt bad about missing out with Andy until we sort of mixed off Rob well missed out as well. So <laughs> you know, like it's a tough, tough game, but. Um, yeah, yeah, very, very tough bridge, and the fact that it was uh, border match as well makes it even more, like, the skill edge in border match is pretty crazy. Um, every over trick, every under trick, everything counts, um, and everyone's extremely ruthless in the bidding as well. Uh, it, it's like match points, but even even more crazy. Yeah. You don't have like field protection or anything like that. You don't just get to your normal three hundred trumps and play it a trick better for your seventy percent board. You've just <laughs> got to like try to somehow do better than Rosenberg at the other table, or something, you know. <laughs> um, and and there's all this constant like guesswork about what would have happened at the other table, what the lead would have been, and how the contract's going to be played so far, and and trying to win the board and stuff. Uh, very 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 interesting. Um, but yeah, the 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 final was um, a very strong event and. Um, actually, um, Sataj, Hans, and Peter Gill, they, they ended up coming fifth, and they were, I think, yeah, decimal points away from a third-place finish, uh, which was which was very cool. Um, they were playing with uh, Bart Bramley and Greg Hines from yeah. America. So, um, yeah, that was that was pretty cool. I think that was their second, fifth, or third, fifth in a row or something. So <laughs> <laughs> they were a bit gutted, considering how close they were to third. But, um, and and, and the, between the leaders, I think it was um, Mark Gordon's team, um, with a bunch of very well-known Americans, were winning until the last board. Um, they had a one board advantage over Vinaconis going to the last three board round. So one and a half all would have been a top, uh, would have been a win for Gordon. Um, and so I think two one was just like a win by a tiny point by Vinaconis, and that's what ended up happening. They ended up winning on the last board. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was, was pr pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, Andy and I were watching it all on Viewgraph on the on the last day after we'd been knocked out. It was it was yeah, really really good bridge to watch. Um, Great experience. So yeah, <laughs> but uh, the, the problem is it's a bit harder for spectators to get yeah. into because they were having to set up and pull down new graph tables every round, and it's only for three boards rather than like the cont the continuity of like sixty four boards of one team against the, against another. Yeah, it's a bit more like a pairs movement, so uh, not not quite as good for spectators. But you get to see a lot of a lot of cool hands, a lot, a lot of good players. Yeah, yeah. I was watching some of the view graph of uh, Gil and Zataj. Uh, if you don't know, they're a top Australian players. They're not always a partnership, but they play a bit together. Um, and I was like, okay, that's Laurie Versace. All right, there's uh, um, <laughs> like just big names just kept rolling through their table. I was like, oh yeah, I know them. I know them. And it's like, yeah, tough field for the final there. Yeah, yeah. We we sat down. I think we played. Um, yeah, I was saying over over twelve boards we played. Laurie Versace, Helga Mohelmas, Mix Rock Rodwell, and Hansom Top Polish Pears, whose name's unpronounceable. You know, and like, it was just um, it was like, okay, let's, let's take a break now. That's one of the cool things about American Laws, every three or four rounds, they just give you a break, you can go get a coffee. And add more time to the clock and say, all right, you can go get a coffee. That was a Yeah. Nick, you haven't ever gone and played a national, have you? Uh, American national? No. I never played bridge in America, but I've been there, been there a couple of times, but I never played bridge. So, yeah, it's uh, it sounds completely different to anywhere else in the world. I mean, I suppose in spirit, maybe in terms of how much. I mean, how how much bridge did you play each day, Lee? Um, yeah, two sessions a day for ten days, um, okay. and like yeah, like a yeah, fifty boards, sixty boards. Yeah, 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 which is kind of. 
that's more like the Australian or New Zealand sort of style of tournament in terms of boards per day. Yeah. But not the yeah. not the yeah. length. And, 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 and a Bermuda Bowl and a Bermuda Bowl was thirty two boards a day. Yeah. And for for those guys who were in the American scene playing regionals, they play seventy boards a day in the knockout. And yeah, let's just say with the thirty two boards a day in the bowl they're not they're not struggling with fatigue. <laughs> yeah, uh, they, 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 they can do the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they seem to be pretty keen on their bridge. I mean, you can play even more than that if you want over in the States. They have the midnight zip knockouts every, every day. Uh, you can go on and play a session starting at half past midnight um, or around midnight. Um, and they have sessions in the morning as well. Andy and I were only playing the 1 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. sessions of your own runs we play every day. That, that's, that's one of those sort of main events. Um, but yeah, you can play even more than that. You just play yeah. like almost 20 <laughs> seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, so that, that's very far removed from the European style, which is kind of, maybe we'll turn up for a set of bridge after dinner, and but we'll finish early enough so that, you know, you've time to go drinking. Uh, <laughs> it's, at least right, five right. hands of bridge will be played per day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we won't yeah. test you too much. Exactly. So, no, I prefer the American style in that regard. You know, you go over there to play bridge, you go over there to play against the best, you want to play as much as you can without, yeah. you know, option. We, we turned up for a week and a half and we played four, like, top class events, you know. You, the, the, that's what you get in an American national. We played the... Mitchell Watermack, oh, the Life Master pairs to begin with, which is a two day pairs, um, qualifying and then final, then Mitchell Water Match, qualifying and final two days, and then you have two three day events, which is Blue Ribbon Pairs and Rising, which are qualifying, semi, then final. And all of those events, if you win any of them, like you suddenly have a reputation, you know, like they're, they're pretty yeah. epic events, all of them. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was uh, you know, like we played Hellboy and Howlers in the Mitchell. And then we played them in the blues. And then we played them again in the rising qualifying. And then we played them in the semi final. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time we got there, like, it was like, oh, you guys again. Like, stop telling me. You know? <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's pretty cool. You know, you get to play the top guys multiple times. We played Laurie and Saki, I think, four times as well. Uh, Mixed Rock Robert a couple of times. By the end of it, they even knew what our names were. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Mm, I'm starting nice. to sit in uh, Mixed Rock and Rodwell to come down and play in the Gold Coast now. I'm like, ah, oh, no, because then it might be hard to do. So maybe. It's not that good. But what do you think about it? Like, Helmut Helmut's like, it's just like super fun to play against. Really cool players and super nice guys as well. And it's like, yeah, it's not why I love playing groups, you know? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Other recent results, uh, back in Australia, uh, the GNOC finished um, a couple of weeks ago, but uh, Sydney managed to uh, beat out Adelaide 1. Seems sort of a bit of a tradition for Sydney to go and win the uh, GNOC, but the GNOC's one of my uh, favourite events. It's a good fun event, but it's just knockouts from the start. Um, but uh, the Sydney team was comprised of Ron Klinger, David Beecham, Avi Konetka, Kim Morrison, Terry Brown, and Peter Buchan. So a pretty solid team there to uh, go win it. But I reckon the GNOT's an awesome, fun event. Have you ever played it, Mel? Yeah, um, the last three years, but, so the reason I didn't play this year was because uh, over, in, over in Denver, I played the last three years in a row and um, I got knocked out in the semis by Adelaide, I think, every time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, I wasn't like super disappointed to see Adelaide lose the final. <laughs> <laughs> To be fair, this time was a different Adelaide. Normally, I just get knocked out by Kildu, I think. Kildu won me every time. Yeah, a great result for um, Peter Buchan as well. I think he won the VCC as well this year. So he's having yep. a pretty good year. I think he won yep. that with his wife and now he's won the GNOT as well. So that's pretty pretty good for him. Um, yeah, I, I, I echo your thoughts on the GNOT. I think it's super fun, even though it's like it's not one of the major tournaments of the year. Yeah. Um, I always go along and have fun. And also, well, it helps with, like, you know, the first couple of rounds of you're a good team, not too challenging. You sort of they're they're and... scary. They are super scary, scary, but they're not too really challenging. It's either win by, like, 80 or lose by three. And because it's yeah. a knockout, it is super scary. It's a 14-board knockout match against 
I like a country team, so they're usually not super strong, but like I remember like I've been knocked out in the first round before. I've played like the opponents got to five no trumps doubled and it made. And I'm like, oh no, not again. Like it's just like everything goes wrong and you lose by like this tiny mind and like, okay, into the rev charge, alright. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky enough that I've played in the lolly scramble reaper charge. <laughs> 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 Not normally, but like, I think I had to play the reaper charge final a couple of times. So for, for, for people who don't know how it works, you have to play, I think, I think you have to win five rockout matches to make the semi final. Yeah, if about. You lose the, if you lose the fifth one, if you win four and then lose the next one, you play in the reaper charge final, which is the uh, uh, semi final. Uh, so I can call the final against the winners of the Reaper Charge and, and winners make the semi final. Um, so, yeah, it was, it, was, it was pretty good fun. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a very, very winnable national. Um, and it's also for people who are looking for playoff points. It's the last, cal the last event on the calendar normally for playoff points. And it's a very, very good event to play playoff points because you need to come top four for playoff points. And if you're playing a knockout match, Against a seeded event where you're expected to play weaker teams for the first few rounds, like very, very good chance of, of getting getting some points compared to like the spring nationals or something where you have to make the top four in like a pretty brutal Swiss, yeah. or you know, the NOC, we have to make the top eight out of 180 teams or something, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, and then I think when you're when you're quarter final, <laughs> so yeah, uh, um. A lot of good things going for it. Though, you know, I know a lot of people don't like playing it, but I, I always thought it was, it was great fun. It was quite sad not to be able to play it this year. Yeah. <laughs> I unfortunately couldn't play it this year because it, the Melbourne selection part for the actual team that Melbourne sent away was when the New Zealand national was on. So I was like, what? Are you kidding me? Like, like most of the top Melbourne players were over in New Zealand. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. So I wasn't surprised that Melbourne didn't make the uh, final there. But, uh, yeah. they, they tried not to uh, send a decent team. Victoria, Victoria never seems to be up there in the demo. Uh, like last couple of years, anyway. I've, I've never, I've, there's always been Sydney and Adelaide. I don't know. Yeah. What, uh, occasionally a team from Canberra. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. that's what I've noticed. It's always been like Sydney 1, Sydney 2, Adelaide 1, Adelaide 3. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> it is a Sydney Adelaide competition. Yeah, yeah. Sydney 1 is normally a pretty, pretty good favourite. Yeah. You do get eight teams. Yeah, eight teams. <laughs> there's a few. one, two, three, three four. four. Yeah, they're all pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Oh, there's Whip Sydney. Ah, oh, that's a missing Sydney team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I just Sunday. want to say, Whip Sunday. Whip Sunday. Yeah. Is it Sunday? Are you kidding me? There's, I think there's oh, a Whip Sunday it's... team from up in uh, North Queensland. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I don't know, Bill. I mean, I know you're a Kiwi like me. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's Sydney, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah, okay. With Sunday. My apologies to uh, in Bali, D. Ryan, in Martin, K. Paul. Uh, I know that hate the, hate the Sydney siders. North Clinton is always like that. So. Oh, God. I got to. Uh, I'd stop before I insult anyone else. <laughs> I've, I've, been, I've, I've been to the Wood Sunday Island, and they're quite a long way away from Sydney. I'm, 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 I feel fairly certain that it's not a Sydney, even though Sydney's quite big. <laughs> so, so do you think Wood Sunday is closer or further further away than Michael Wibley was when he played for Sydney? Um, <laughs> Michael Wibley was firmly allowed to play for Sydney <laughs> in the letter of the regulation. So what, what was had, the? And we had the D-Not convener on our side, which is why he was allowed to play. The so home club was Sydney, and the regulations allowed you to play for Sydney if your home club was Sydney. So Melbourne, uh, sorry, Wibley was living in Melbourne, right? Mm. He was firmly oh, living in Melbourne. Wow. I'm just checking. It. Yeah, like, his his first <laughs> life, I like to believe, was centered in Sydney. Yeah, but <laughs> the only thing was, he was registered to a club in Sydney, right? Yeah. So he joined your team. And not have been registered to a club in Sydney because he was given a good deal by someone with the last name ending with Monty. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, that doesn't mean he's not a Sydney type. And he did come to Sydney several times that year. And he did stay in Sydney for quite a long time during some of the times. 
<laughs> it may have even accrued some master points at some club in Sydney. <laughs> so I now understand why it's always Sydney Adelaide because Sydney just steals <laughs> our good players. Hey, look, 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 I, I was responsible for closing that loophole. Laura <laughs> <laughs> Hazel was so pissed off at, at what I did to, to sneak Michael Willie and he closed the loophole within you know a couple of days after he found out. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Victoria will have a chat next year. Except that uh, Wibbly just left. And so did Nick, yeah. and so did Elena. <laughs> well, I'm sure the three of us... Well, at least, at least, at least you don't have to worry about up players, you know, coming and playing for Sydney just because they belong to a Sydney British club. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. Just on a final note for the G-Knot, um, the, the little Perth crew, you know, the... Um, Cheska McGrath and Reese Cooper did very well. Yeah. Um, in the Swiss, they went undefeated through nine rounds, just one draw. Yeah. And got to the Repercharge finals and lost to Tony Nunn and Michael Wilkinson, uh, Martin Bloom and Matthew Varda. So good. Varda, sorry. A good, so a good team by two imps. Yeah. So good effort from the young ones. Good showing has by he, the WA it, youth players. What was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah good showing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we've sort of sort of touched on it, but I was going to mention uh, scoring methods. So we've discussed um, border match, which the Risinger was, and knockouts, which the Genot is. But there's so many different uh, scoring methods out there. What's uh, your favourite sort of scoring method, or Nick? Do you? Wow, um, I haven't played with too many. Honestly, I don't even. I've only probably played fifty hands of rubber in my life. I guess, <laughs> which is kind of fun. Rummy rubber is actually a pretty cool little method for, you know, getting together and just have, you know, you just, it's not quite bridge, you know, you do stuff like my, an option, like one no trump, well, no system at all, no agreements, you know, one no <laughs> trump pass, two no trumps is just a slam try because <laughs> you've got a part score of 60 and so you're, you're good to go. You don't need, you don't need 70 points, you only need 40. Um, the problem is, Whenever I played rubber, it's been with people who have never played rubber before, and so you have like options like one trump pass, three trumps, and you're like, we've got like, bro, we've got eighty on the board. Just <laughs> what, are you, what are you up to? Why, why are we playing one diamond? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, sorry, my opening of one trump was slam try as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, it's pretty out there, but it's good. Um, but yeah, I think border match and match points. Really, really underrated formats. And I don't even think they're underrated by expert players. I think, you know, a lot of expert players really enjoy it, but I think it's that next tier down that really, really dislikes match point and border match um, games. And I, I don't know if it's because of a lack of understanding or not kind of knowing the positions, but really it just adds so much complexity to it and so much you know, of the dynamic of trying to work out what, what's happening at, everywhere else and what are my trick packages that I'm getting, you know, and you can kind of work it out percentage-wise, you can work it out um, if, then, yada, yada, whatever way works for you. There's a lot more thinking about how many tricks am I going to get if I do this versus this versus this and how's the defence likely to continue. Whereas an MC kind of a lot more along the lines of, well, what's the... You know what's the best and safest way to make my, make my contracts, and, and yeah, I I enjoy the the dynamic of trying to you know go say you know six off in three no trump vulnerable undoubling <laughs> rather than going seven off or something like that, which I think you know these sorts of problems are actually kind of interesting. <laughs> I do find that you find lots of people not finding end plays or squeezes for their second under trick or things like that. Like, those squeezes and end plays are for making your contract or over tricks. People don't often find those plays for just saving the under tricks, which I think are mm. awesomely fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then, like, so many times down at the club, you, you end up in some contract, you just can't, can't make it. Yeah. And... You're just like, how do I avoid two off? Like, that's a cool problem to have, you know? And that problem, like, you don't care that much of them, but, you know, yeah, obviously every trick matters of them, but 
some troops miss medalists than others, and, uh, and, and, and peers are all the same for the most part. They're all tricks and they're all match points pretty much every time, especially over a big field. Uh, they're all worth something. And um, yeah, I, but the thing I find interesting is that the, um, the rank and file don't seem to like match point as much. They love Swiss peers. Like I don't, I just don't get it. Like I honestly, like that's my <laughs> least favorite score, form of scoring by absolute country mile. Like I just, I just don't get it. Like, and at the same time, I have a lot of respect for what you know, the everyday bridge player who just comes to a country congress wants to have a go. Like, that, good. If you, yeah. if you enjoy bridge and it makes some things popular, I have respect for that. Personally, though, I just, I just find it so random. There's so many other factors involved in. Other than your skill level, you know that's that, that, and that, that really really turns me off Swiss pairs. And over in the states, I don't think I saw a single Swiss pairs event. Uh, I know they have an impairs event, which is a bit different, where your imps are crossed against the rest of the field. I don't really know exactly what that brings into play. I've, I've only ever played a couple of imp events, impairs events in my life. Um, but yeah, the, the Swiss pairs just wasn't there. Um, and in fact, I've got no problem with the Swissing of it because one of the best events of the year in the Australian calendar is the Dick Cummings Open Pairs during yeah. Spring Nationals. And that is a match pointed pairs event, but it's by Swiss. So the the, the obvious um, problem with match points is that um, it depends who your opponents are. Like if you sit down and play in a New Zealand Pairs semi-final, for example, it matters a lot who your opponents are. If you have yeah. if you play like five of the top pairs versus two of the top pairs, like that can make a huge impact on your score. You know, you might just lose five percent of your score. Yeah. But in this, if you if you Swiss it, but you still have the match point scoring and you convert it to VPs, it's just like just turns into an awesome, very high skill, um, skill edge event, and at the same time it's still really fun. Like you get breaks in between the rounds, go to these eight board rounds, and um, you know there's still a bit of swing to be done. Like the same way there is in a Swiss pairs event, so if you're doing badly, you can try to aim for a top on the last board, that sort of thing. Like there's, there's lots of cool stuff about it. That that would I reckon that's a huge improvement on. Swiss peers as they are played for the most part. Just do Swiss match, yeah. Swiss match one of peers. <laughs> yeah. Um, for those that don't know, I'll just try and give a brief rundown of the different scoring methods. So, common is imps teams, uh, where you play, you score up with your teammate, and if you get a score, it's converted into an imp chart where, if you basically win a game bonus, you get about ten imps. If you get a part score bonus, you get about five imps. If you get an under trick thing. It's about two, and an over trick might be one. So different things are rated different high, at different levels. And if you get a slam bonus, that's huge. Game bonus, that's awesome. Both of those are really good, whereas over tricks and under tricks are valued a lot less. Uh, match points, every single trick matters. And if you score 10 points more than the other person, that's as good as getting a game bonus more than them. So as long as you do better than each person, that's valuable. And border match, which we referenced and the rising it was about, is it's you just versus one other team. So there's only one comparison. So your whereas match points pairs is about 15 other comparisons usually. This is just one comparison, and you have to do better than that one person or draw with them or lose them. And it's very volatile but really skill dependent. Swiss pairs is using the team's imp scoring. I guess the main issue that lots of people have with that is that what you find is if you don't get the cards to bid games, you just lose lots of imps, right? And there's not much to it because not everyone in the field will bid games, and that's what people feel punished about. Is that what your main issue with Swiss pairs is? Yeah, like, um, it depends quite a lot on the pond the card you hold, um, yeah. which, like, in teams, it's just a round If you bid it more for a trump, it's always it's always flat against a good team, um, pretty much. Whereas if you if your opponent's bid a cold three a trump against you in the Swiss pit, it's like always lose two or always lose three. You know, yes, yeah. you you can't win it. Um, you, you're you're always going to lose a couple, and uh, like that's not much fun. Um, obviously. Teams, the, the the slams and the games do magnify the swings and. Um, most matches are decided by a game of slam hands, but in Swiss pairs it's like even more so. Like you bid a slam in a match, in an eight board match, and you just sit down and do nothing for the rest of the match. You won like a huge, you, you, you get a huge score just for bidding one slam, and or you know 
just for being the subject on Delta Slam. Um, and, you know, <laughs> it's a bit sad. If you get an obvious slam to bid and you have like some one major Jacoby Trino Trump or one major four, four minus splinter option, you can just easily bid to it just because you know, you know what those conventions are and you've seen a few slams in your life before. You're going to win like eight ibs on the field. Yeah. And it's, so it's, you know, it's nice when it happens, but I don't like it that you just, it just depends on which way you have them to sit. You know, that's, whereas yes. in, a, in a team's game, it doesn't matter. You know, if it's an easy plan to bid your opponents will bid it, if it's not, then, you know, you, you get points for bidding it and you don't have to be done. And that's, that's sort of how it should be. Um, whereas Swiss peers, you get points even if everyone should be bidding it. Yeah. Not everyone does. So part of that comes from that, uh, if you're at the top end of the field, all the good players will either bid it or not, whether it's make like approximately if it's making or not. Yeah. But not everyone in the field's going to bid it. There will be like some down the bottom that are a bit inexperienced or whatever, and they don't bid it. So the people that get the cards and have the chance to bid it get the reward. Whereas at the teams, you only need you and one other team to do it which is expected to happen if it's like an obvious contract for experienced players to bid, which just doesn't get duplicated all the way through the field, but most of the way through the field. Yeah, and that's the same, it's the same problem with Davis. Yeah. You know, uh, so so uh, for, for people who don't know what they are, it's just, it's basically, your, it's an equivalent of what you might have scored in a Swiss Peers event um, when you're playing a team's. And you'll notice all these good players are doing well on the datums, but they're earning a bunch of their imps, not doing anything special. They're bidding and making a game when they got 25 points, or yeah. they're bidding and making a slam when they've got a whole bunch of a whole huge bid and lots of controls. And they're not actually winning imps in their matches from it. They're just winning datum imps. Yeah. <laughs> they're winning datum imps because not everyone is bidding imps. Like they're, they're sure they're doing a good thing, right? And they're preventing their team from losing imps. But they don't end up gaining much from it if they're playing a good team because the other team will normally bid it as well. And but they do win these imaginary data maps uh, versus the rest of the field. So th th that's uh, it's, it's one of the, one of the problems with data maps in a field that's quite uneven. Like I, I, I I'm a huge believer in data in something like the Bermuda Bowl, where it's a week long, long event, lots of good competition, uh, lots of good scores to compare against. Most of the pairs are pretty decent, you know. But like data maps in the NOT, for example. Pretty much every time the winners of the datums and the NOT are a team that's on a weekend that doesn't do that well, um, and they happen to be playing weak opponents every round. You know. Hey, Nick's uh, won those datums. Don't don't knock them. Hey, hey <laughs> dude, 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 dude. I, 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 the year the year I won the datums in the NOT, I was like plus two point seven inch the board, right? <laughs> and I was on a team which like a bit, almost certainly was not going to make the knockout. <laughs> but I was playing with a good partner yeah. and we played weak opponents every round because our you know. Our teammates will often bring back bad scores, and yeah, we won a day of by a mile. And, and it, it wasn't even a struggle. We didn't, we didn't even play that well. Our, our teammates, our opponents played so badly. And uh, you know, that, that's the reality of datums. You know, that's just how it works. Right. You both were at the boom meter bowl. Who did better on the datums? Oh, say not me. I, I was I was minus but zero point one four. I don't know. I don't, I don't look up where Nick was. Zero point one four times how many? I know Well, how many over how oh, many? Oh, like total, 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 yeah. I don't know. I don't remember. I have, no, I have no idea what my head. Yeah. We were, we were even heading into the last day, and then we lost two matches pretty badly. So we were probably about minus 65 or 70 over the whole day. Um, not a good way to finish. So we, yeah, our yeah. total over was like minus. 65, 70, uh, modified, right. I think, but whatever. It was, no, no, our whole team was hopeless. We were all minus some, something or other. <laughs> or another. Um, but yeah, it's completely echo your, your thoughts that it's, you know, it, it's a use, it can be a useful metric when the quality of play, uh, when the quality of opposition is uh, up to standard. I mean, one way to look at it in a, a general Australian or New Zealand field, it's not just Australia or New Zealand, it could be anywhere in the world, really. You know, you say you have 50 tables and um, you're defending a, for, a completely normal force fade contract at your table. Uh, you defend it nicely, you hold it to 10 tricks, say 
let's say 40, 40 tables are in four spades. Um, the completely normal contract, everyone should get that, but only 40 out of 50 bit. Um, of those 40, say 25 uh, make 650 or more, and 15 get the right defense or misplay it and get 620. Now, yeah. you take the other 10, 10 scores, and they are often random. You know, you get people going down in this cold game, you get people missing game, you get people bidding too high and going off, and you, let's say these 10 random scores are all lower than 620. They're the equivalent of a part score or below for your opponents. So if you were scoring it on match points, uh, you would be rewarded by... Um, beating 25, uh, 25 tables. Those guys, you've got 650, you're beating them. You're yeah. tying with the other 14 pairs who also got 620. And you're losing to the 10 random pairs, which means you would get, um, how many? There are 100 match, well, there are 98 match points up for grabs, and you would get, um, you'd get quite a lot, wouldn't you? That's all, yeah. that's my maths. You'd get quite a lot. Yeah. Solid maths, yeah. So, yeah. It's all maths. Yeah, you'd get sort of a, like a 66% board or something like that. So, um, yeah, you know, you're doing well. You get rewarded for your good defense. In Swiss, yeah, 66%, you, you win a tournament by a mile. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Average 66%, easy. In Swiss, you, you win every tournament gain. in the world if you get an average 66%. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah easy. Easily. I mean, what, what did the winners score in your when you played in um, the, uh, when you finish? Uh, uh, in the top 10 in the world pairs? Uh, usually uh, in the world pairs, I thought you were going to ask about the Akarana uh, Christmas. Um, oh, no. Uh, <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> but in, in, in the world pairs, usually the winners average 55%. <laughs> yeah, right, 55. So, and that's the yeah. best, and lo best and longest pairs tournament in the world. It's five sessions normally in the final. Yeah. So 55% of, you know, and 60% and will normally be enough in a, in a one-day tournament in, in Australia and New yeah. Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, in however, you look at this situation in Swiss pairs, uh, 25 time, you know, basically, I mean, you're not comparing per table, you're comparing versus an average, but effectively, it's like 25 times you gain it, and, and, you know, 15 times nothing happens, and 10 times you lose 10 imps or something. Yeah. I mean, that, that's how it works in cross imps, uh, but cross imps tends to have. Stronger fields, I don't know why. <laughs> but anyway, the similar, similar thing happens in um, in Swiss pairs, and you will have, I don't know, you'll lose like five or something on the board, maybe four or five, I guess, my rough estimate. Um, and you know, you've done a good thing, you've done the only yeah. thing you could do on the hand, and you get, you actually got nothing. You probably could have just conceded 650 and it wouldn't have changed anything. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's, that's, I guess that's that's my, that's my main my main problem, right? Like normally, so I I play a lot of match points. I, I play mm. um, professionally duplicate at the club, you know, three times a week, four times a week. And if there's something to do and you do it, you don't normally get a bad board. You get, like, it's pretty easy just to estimate your score based on did you do a good thing or did you did you did you miss it? And if there was nothing to do and you didn't do anything, it's just, it's just irrelevant. Sometimes you get a bottom, most of the time it's just not. Most of the time yeah. it's just a, a slightly good board for them, slightly bad board for them, or an average. In a Swiss pairs, you sit down and you just get done. You just get done board after board. Like, yeah. so a bit of game and make it, oh, okay, just lose a huge amount. Like, yeah. A bit of slam, like you're, you just, you're done. Like, and and yeah. I, just, I just hate that. Like, you just get like getting randomly done for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> so often. Swiss pairs are so depressing. The number of matches that you just lose by a mile where you just sat down and had nothing to do. If you look, neither, you, your partner and you played perfectly or, or the entire thing, you lose 19 1. Like that, that happens way too often. I play Swiss pairs. Liam, can I remind you of a quote? It's mm. better to be lucky than good. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. my philosophy. You just want to be dealt the cards, bid the games, win. Yeah. My solid strategy: yeah. be lucky. I would, I would love Swiss pairs if I was a lucky card holder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyway, we'll move on to the next thing, which was any uh, what was happening over in um, Denver. Like, 
What's the differences between the American tournaments and the Australian tournaments? Any things you notice really from that? Okay. So the main difference is the schedule. Um, you start at 1 p.m. and you have a second session at 7.30. Um, every tournament in Australia that I can think of has morning play. Um, the Gold Coast used to be 11 a.m., which is a bit later than usual. Most of them are 10 a.m. Um, some of them are 9.30, which is a little bit uncivilized. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so Denver, the hours we kept were basically get up at 12 <laughs> and get ready, and go to bridge, 1.30 to 4.30, play, go to dinner, play from 7.30 until 11, then go to the bar. And you have to go to the bar and socialize because that's where all the clients are and that's where all the top players are. If you yeah. want to give a play problem or a lead problem to Mextrop, he'll be there. You know, yeah. and, you know, Justin Lyle will be there, Ishmael will be there, everyone's there, right? So you've got to go to the bar, and then you go home at 3 o'clock. <laughs> that, that was pretty much every day, right? And we're like, grab some, like, some crap from Walmart on the way home. <laughs> so, uh, not like actually the most healthy lifestyle. Um, so, and the other thing is, uh, there's hospitality breaks, which I've never encountered before, where they add time to the clock, so your sessions will be three half hours rather than three hours because you just get several breaks during a, a session to go to the toilet or get a coffee or whatever. Obviously some positives, some negatives. Um, the results on the website were just like completely hopeless as, and apparently that was like the level at which they were was good compared to usual, <laughs> well, well, it's completely unavailable. But when the rising of semi results come out like three hours after the session's finished and you can just like search for them and if you're a math genius you can find them. That's like quite good. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, like, um, aside from the logistical side of things, the bridge is just awesome, you know? Like, yeah. uh, um, play keeps the top guys. I, I, I mentioned that before. One really strange thing, like a lot of people have heard about um, the system restrictions. So Andy and I went over and we couldn't play a multi. Um, yeah. And we also couldn't play two diamonds weak both majors. We were thinking about playing two diamonds weak Four plus spades, five exactly five plus or uh, five or more hearts, right? If you make it five four either way, you can no longer play that because it has to be a six board or longer round. So it has to be a team game. <laughs> uh, that's so much more difficult to defend against, right? You know both anchors. Wow, that's tough. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you have if you're known if it's a weak flannery, you're allowed it, but only if you get a three page printed defense from the ACPL. <laughs> so we only found out about it about 10, 10 minutes before game time. We had no time to go find a copy and print it out. So we just played week two diamonds. Yeah. The whole Which to yeah. me is just crazy. Like, it's not hard to defend against two diamonds week 4-4 four, four plus in the major. That's not a difficult convention to defend against. You know what the suits are, you know? I'm not telling you about one suit. I'm telling you about two of my suits. Yeah, Watch yeah. out. I'm telling, you, no, I'm telling you about two things. Like, I understand multi. Like, you don't know either suit. It's a bit tricky. Yeah. But oh, at the same time, I don't understand multi. Like, you should obviously be able to. <laughs> the fact that like every club player in New Zealand can deal with multi, like if you sit down at a random British club in New Zealand, everyone plays two diamonds, weak in a major, two hearts, five hearts, four of a minor, two spades, five spades, four of a minor. Like pretty much everyone plays that everywhere. If you go down to the south of Sydney, you know what they play there? Two diamonds is weak, uh, both majors, both minors. <laughs> two hearts <laughs> is weak, uh, blacks or reds, and two spades is rat is weak with. Spades and diamonds or hearts and clubs. That's, everyone plays at South of Sydney. I don't think that would get into the American tournament. Uh, <laughs> I'm feeling that might not even sneak into like the the spring old final. You know, like it's just that's just crazy to me. Um, and there were also more directed calls about just bullshit than I've seen before. We we were warned about it that that's the American style to call a director on you for not having a system card sitting on the table in front of the opponent that sort of thing. Um, and most people wouldn't do that. And, but yeah, I think three peers called the director on us just for nothing, like for nothing to do with any, any bridge hand. Um, and it would warn us and threaten us, and then we wouldn't cooperate. So like, why would you put a card for us on? They're just like demanding it for no reason. And they call the director, and we're, like we were warned about it, and it happened. And they were all American peers, and they were all weak peers. Um, but you know. That's just a, a small cultural difference, I guess. Uh, not, not a huge problem, but it does exist. Um, the whole win by director thing, uh, more so than in Australia and New Zealand, I think. But apart from that, yeah, well, just a sort of good top level bridge. Uh, yeah, and, and 
we, we only played board and match and match points the whole time we were over there for 10 days. So it was, you know, every trip matters. You feel pretty yeah. close at the end of the day. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right, we'll move on to the final thing, which was uh, our tips section. Uh, well, this week we're going to talk about tips on uh, how to choose what information is relevant. Like, uh, there's so much stuff coming in. How do you choose what to actually use? And like, when do you have to count shape? When do you have to count points? What do you reckon, Nick? What do you use to solve your issues? Um, I, I guess you go in with a a sort of a broad evaluation of your hand. Um, you might pick up your pick up your hand and say, okay, this is a one and a Um You might actually have like a two two six three or something. Say yeah. Um, and they, and so suddenly it all changes when it goes pass on your right, and then you're like, okay, I don't. Oh, sorry, when it goes one one of a suit on your on your right, and then you think, okay, I don't really have to stop there. I will just uh, call my six out suit. However, you you approach it with a general a general evaluation, and and then when some as soon as something happens, you start you start kind of de developing a a more refined version. And I think, you know, this is something that I, I never used, well, I never used to care about. Yeah. And that, and I think this is, you know, try and take less positions early on in an option that you might feel, you know, uh, you might feel completely tied down about resolving later on. So... I'm not saying that you should open no trump only on four to four trump reads or whatever. If you evaluate your hand as one no trump only, which you need two two six three, whatever fourteen count is a strong no trump only. Yeah. Um, on regardless of where stoppers are, anything like that, and you know, the 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 point is you and your partner make that decision. You know, what's our, you know, what's our style with these things, and so you make your simple evaluation. You make the bid that you and your partner have agreed is the is a description for your hand in this position and then as more information comes in you make more and more precise evaluations so oh and this is one of the things that i think people get way too way 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 too worked up over is like you know should i be upgrading this hand to a no trump should i be downgrading it out of a no trump, should I be doing this or should I be opening this hand? Should I be passing this hand? Yeah. Just do whatever's right for your partnership. You know, I don't really mind if it's got Jack 10x or Jack 9x or you know whatever. Like, can I interrupt you for just a tiny yeah, sure. brief second? I reckon a, re a really good rule for post mortems in a partnership is never ever discuss a one point difference in a hand. Yeah. If it's a 14 count yeah. or a 15 count, that is not what you should be talking about. You should be talking about why you didn't make your 10 tricks or whatever. Yeah. That's way, way, way more important. Like, every second that you end up discussing, oh, whether that queen deck double was worth three points or two points or one point, like, seriously, focus on, like, making your tricks and yeah. when, you, when you're playing the hand and defending the hand. One point... If it's, if it's only one point, like, pretty, like dude, don't bother discussing it. And that, like, Jack my next, Jack next, just not worthy of discussion. It's just a waste of everyone's time. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. continue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, just to build on that as well, when dummy comes down, you know, uh, I mean, we're, we're always, you know, developing an idea of what partners got during the auction because we're trying to place a contract and so on. But once the dummy goes down, that's what you've got, you know. A lot of people, dummy goes down and they, you know, their, their cards go down and they're like, what? You know, what, what were you doing with this? Or what was this? Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it's like... Where was the know, hand you had in the office? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. And, you know, everyone has a little laugh or whatever. But, you know, often after that, the clearer just misplays or whatever. <laughs> and you think, oh, it could work. That yeah, was real funny. You know, the <laughs> amount of times it's seen... Poorly bid dummies lead to makeable contracts, and then to clear up thinking, you, what the, you know, how could you put down this dummy for me? And then they go off to this makeable contract, and you think, I actually stop worrying about how you find the bid it, just if it's makeable, make it. So, you're, it's definitely a good point. Um, and yeah, I just, 
I'm not, I'm really not interested in all the you know should I downgrade this and that because you know you talk to a lot of good players and because you know I used to be really interested in should I upgrade or downgrade. This is why I feel like I can say don't worry about it because <laughs> you talk to good players and they say like who cares you know just like yeah. you don't know your deck third's going to be a shit holding. I mean it probably is, but you know, or partner's about to transfer and show a you know, their own solid six card suit and the slam try and jack third is suddenly fine and you're like, <laughs> oh, all right, okay, well, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Like, you know, it's one of those things that, um, I mean, there's a, there, have you guys heard of, like, uh, Banzai points? Which is like, yeah, a, yeah, 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 yeah. Five, I, 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 yeah. I played with a wrong player, I played with a wrong player in an event, I played with a wrong player in the game a couple of years ago, you know, uh, so I know all about the, yeah. the Banzai's. Would you recommend them? And, 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 um, yeah, I, look, I, I hope Ron doesn't watch the video. Um, <laughs> because, uh, we did Benny Craig for a bunch of times, and I just opened one of cup and I had between 15 and 17 points. And he's uh, <laughs> like, oh, you're a bit strong on bun vibes, or a bit weak on bun vibes every time. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I just decided, you know, just look, I just like mentioned some feature, like, why I did what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I just use an all points and then just talk about fun later. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe I'm just uh, setting my ways. So, uh, <laughs> have you heard? Have you heard Alex's quote, Nick, about um, about points? So, uh, yeah. so um, this is about downgrading upgrades. So, in in system notes um, for precision. So, Satanjans put put together a, a precision document for Australian pairs, uh, which is quite widely used, and and it says upgrade frequently, downgrade. Uh, really think positive, be positive, right? But Alex has got an even better version, which I think is that there are a, a, a point and there are good points. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> there, are, there are no bad points. That's a point. That's a point. That's a point. So, three. Ace, King, back 10. That's not the point. That's, uh, they're good points. That's, but, that's, that's not bad. They're <laughs> 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 downgrading. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. I like that. Uh, yeah, I think people should, yeah, people should adopt that more. You know, you kind of, uh, I mean, I mean nowadays, right, passing twelve counts and stuff as an opening hand, like you just think, you know, oh yeah, well, what's the point? You know, you just you're opening elevens and you you're opening most elevens. You actually want you want to open a lot of tens because you've got all the good ten good points. And then you're like, oh, well, actually, I'm just going to pass this 12. Yeah. Oh, it's not good enough. It's good. I'm just going to clean that down. So, uh, you know, I just passed it. <laughs> and, and it's like, just don't. <laughs> you wanna, it's, you trust me, it's, it's alive and well in America. There are quite a lot of dudes who are not opening their 11s, and they're like, oh, 12, good 12, bad 12. Like, I remember a quote from Alex. Someone was talking about having a bad 18, and Alex was like, I never had a bad 18. It's 18 points. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good 18. You've got like almost half the deck in your hand. <laughs> queen deck doubles? Well, it's better than the opponent having a queen and deck. <laughs> <Yes>. That's right. <laughs> but yeah, seriously, it's it's really hard to just evaluate. You know, you, you actually have to play a lot and you don't have to think too much about points. Just you, like, just look at your hand. Is it a good? Is it a good hand? Is it a a normal hand? Whatever. Don't take big positions early on. Just bid what you're. Do something normal. Partner will tell you something. Your opponents will tell you something. And then you can start thinking more about how everything's fitting together and how yeah. good your hand is, how bad your hand is, how good your shape is, how bad your shape is. So, yeah, I think that that's that's my advice. Mm -hmm. You know. But uh, I think I think Pete's um, question was something about like wh what how do you know what's relevant when and uh, um, yeah. they actually got they, they got me thinking about um, uh, a little bit of work I've been doing with uh, Daniel Braun. So uh, Braun is a guy who's trying to make the youth team next year. Um, you know he's a bit of an up and comer. He's trying to improve his thought process. He's trying to put yeah. a, lot of, a lot of work into it. And one of the things he does is he uh, plays BBO and records. Uh, his play on video and then nice. sends them to people and says, 
Yeah. And, he, and he's talking out loud. He's saying, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm thinking. And, uh, and then you can sort of like criticize his thought process. It's, it's, um, it's a process that's done a lot with poker, and he's a poker player. Um, and I, I was originally a poker player as well, and so it's, it's very appealing to me to someone say, yeah, there's one thing in here, there's one thing in here, all right, this happens, this happens, and, and it's just like a, 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 a stream of, you know, of, of your brain. And, yeah, my advice to him was shape is always relevant. If you're defending a hand and you know something about the shape, you should always start processing it. Like, you should try to count the clear of shape every time, because so many times you end up counting a shape and then you suddenly know the whole hand, despite yeah. the fact that you didn't think it was relevant. You didn't know it was relevant ahead of time. So I basically say that, like, what's relevant when, like, the clearer shape is relevant every single hand until you know it's not, you know? Yeah. Um, and the only way you can do that is just by habit. You just, it just has to become a habit. And I can tell you for sure, anyone watching this, that every top player, they know your shape at trip two <laughs> pretty much most of the time, and it's just because that's how they roll, you know? Yeah. Like, the, there was... Like a hand that Daniel sent me the other day. Uh, Declara opened one of a minor, rebid two no trump, and then did three no trump next. And uh, partner led something, dummy had three spades and we had two. And you know straight away spades are four four. Yeah. Between Declara and partner's hand. Partner didn't lead one or overcall one, so he can't have five. Declara didn't open them, so he can't have five. You just know, right? You yeah. don't need to ask the dummy whether Declara denied four spades. You don't need to. Say, you know, should he, would we have shown them a different option? You just know. You know, like, that partner would have led a spade if he had five, or overcalled a spade if he had five. And it's just like a super, super simple inference. When you can only see three spades in dummy and two in your hand, there's eight out there. Dummy, the declarer can't have five, partner can't have five, so they both got four, right? It's very, yeah. very simple. You don't know if it matters, but you, you have to put it in there. And on this hand yeah. that he gave me, the, the knowledge declarer had four spades, pinpointed his entire shape. And he just knew the whole hand. And yeah. suddenly, the rest of the event, you could not, you didn't even have to think about it. It was just one inference, then combined with putting it together with the other information from the bidding, it was like suddenly declare it has to be four, four, two, three, a hundred percent of the time. The lead, the bidding, everything put it together, and then you knew that just from one card the partner had led in the appearance of dummy. And like that has to be a habit. If you want to get anywhere, you have to count. You know, it's just yeah, just just a just a thing. So. What, re- what information is relevant when I say the shape is always relevant. So you know it's not, which is very rare. You just need to count it. That's a huge tip. <laughs> you know, don't, don't try to think about how can I improve my thought process by thinking less. It's like actually just think more. Just think about shape every hand. <laughs> you have to do it. <laughs> yeah. I love counting shape. Like, I, I think that all top players do it. It's just amazing. Just, I, yeah. I find it find it interesting playing like at a really low level duplicate where you're playing against really inexperienced people and you sit there even if you're dummy and you're playing with someone that's like maybe it's their first duplicate or something and you're sitting there as dummy going please play this winner this two here is a winner please play and like i do so much of it that it just becomes instinctive that even dummy i can only see 13 cards and you still know that these cards are winners and these aren't. And there's just so much instinctive knowledge there that you don't need to see the other hands. You just know this stuff or you count this just by, like, keeping track of the cards. You're not trying to count because you've done so much of it that it just gets built in. So you definitely... You not do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I know the feeling. Like, yeah, if you're playing in a... Say, say you have a lesson, right? You, you hold a lesson to people and you sit in with three... You know, students who are who are beginners or or something. If you're a dummy, you will like even despite the fact you don't have as much information as them, the fact yeah. that you're interpreting it differently. And it's not because you're smarter, and it's not because you're better. It's because it's a habit. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. It's just a habit. You know, <laughs> like so, saying that someone like you know, um, like has a better body or something because they were born with better genetics. No, it's just because they've got a habit of doing push-ups every morning. Like, that's, that's, <laughs> it's just that, like, there's, no, there's no magic here. It's just like, they just, they do it because they do it. You know, that's it. they do it because they do it. They decided yeah. at some point to do it and became a habit. And it's the same thing with top players. Dummy comes down, you start crunching. Like, I start every single hand that I play, when there's one of Trump, three of Trump, and dummy comes down, I know part of the exact point range. And it's within yeah. five seconds. And it's just, it's just a habit, you know? 
you count your cards, you count your points, count Bubby's points, subtract 15 to 17 points, and you know partner's point. And it's the first thing I do, I count Bubby's points when I'm playing the hand as well, not just to say partner, you know, you showed 10 to 12 and you only have five, you know, not, not just because of that, but also because like, it's just so you know how many points your opponents have, it's just a yeah. habit. And uh, that's one of the things I try to get my students to do is sort of build on their habits, you know, make it a habit, make it a habit, count the points, count the shape, make it a habit. Once it's a habit, I don't need to talk to you anymore. Yes. <laughs> you're you're going to be beating me yeah. and I'll be yeah, requesting yeah. lessons. I'm talking, I'm talking myself out of a job <laughs> by teaching these, these people with habits, but it's, that's it. It's just, just you have to have the habits. It's, it's, nothing, it's not, not skill, it's habits. It's yeah. Winning habits, I think. Huge part of bridge. Yeah. Any last comments, Nick? Uh, no, no, I think it's been, uh, it's been really enjoyable listening to um, what what the bridge has been like over in Denver. Um, you know, I think playing the bowl in Chennai it was really good for getting a taste of that sort of thing. And it, and then you go to you go to Denver and it's like you get everyone who was in Chennai plus more, like plus, <laughs> you know, all the guys who are completely good enough to play there who won the thing you know, countless times before, and they're there as well. And you're just like, okay, it's sweet. Yes, you, you get and, the guys and also you play who didn't even play the bowl. You get the guys <laughs> who didn't play the bowl because they had to play the transnationals because they were playing professionally, and that meant more than, you know, playing the bowl. Yeah. Like that, and that, you, know, you play a lot of a lot of top guys, you know. Uh, uh, you know what? Like, basically, with, with, with Denver, everyone wants to go play in the American Nationals, right? Like, I assume both of you guys yeah. want to go play in America at some point, yeah. right? Yeah. Andy and I just decided now's the time. <laughs> we both got yeah. we're both not that busy in at the end of November to December. We both got enough money to be able to go over and do it despite not getting paid and just go and and you know, you have to make your way somehow. And if you go over and win the blue river pairs, you're done, you know. Yeah. That's it. You can move to America and become a professional bridge player and make a lot of money. That's, that's <laughs> it, you know? it's quite a good incentive. And um, to anyone thinking about it, I would just say find a week and a half and just go do it because, you know, that uh, in 2017, I think the fall nationals or the summer nationals are being held in Hawaii much closer, only half the distance. So think about it. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Return flights for less than a thousand. So yeah. uh, I think I think Andy and I already have a date for Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, we might uh, wrap it up. Thanks, Milne, for joining us. Much appreciated. Pleasure. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Thanks very much, guys. Cheers. See ya. <laughs>